If you're ready to stand on the line, if you're ready to fight back and serve it to the criminals trying to enslave you and steal your wealth through monetary creation and exorbitant taxation, you're in the right place. Welcome back to another edition of the Prepper Recon Podcast. Whether your plan is to bug out or bug in, CampingSurvival.com has all of your preparedness needs, including fish antibiotics, long-term storage food, water filters, bug out bags, and first aid kits. Use coupon code PREPPERRECON for 5% off your entire order at CampingSurvival.com. While you're at PrepperRecon.com, stop by the Prepper Recon Supply Store. We've got a great selection of Molly compression packs, hydration kits, and our new concealed carry tactical slings. All the packs and slings come with your choice of patch to let liberals know how you feel. We have some very cool Mulan Lay patches, Come and Take It patches, Sheepdog, Zombie Response Team, and Matching U.S. Flag patches. Of course, we still have our fully stocked Molly compatible individual first aid kits as well. Just click the store tab at the top of the PrepperRecon.com homepage. Today's guest is Weston Warren. Weston was on the show a few weeks back to talk about the indoor air purification technology that he's developed. Weston, welcome back. Good to be back. How are you doing? Very good. Very good. And it's, uh, it's great to have you on the show. Now, you've studied environmental sciences. Is that correct? Uh, Yes, that is. And uh, now something many of us are confused about is global warming. With the massive freeze we had last year, you know, they had to bring the polar bears in inside. They couldn't stay outside at the zoo because it was too cold for the polar bears. Uh, and then this year we had a really, really early blizzard where uh, the northeast got dumped with uh, six feet of snow. Uh, this just kind of doesn't add up to the the global warming Thing that we've been fed for uh, a couple of decades now. Can you help us understand what's happening? Yes, I can. Uh, the information I re- review will be, uh, it, it's very interesting, uh, but it, it could be somewhat controversial as far as uh, there's a lot of people that fully believe in global warming. It's almost become a religion for some a lot of government agencies and institutions have gotten on that uh, bandwagon so when i talk about this information in this interview those of that mindset that will be listening tend to get a little defensive and and i want to respect their beliefs and understandings and i don't want to be arrogant and come across as a as a know-it-all but i think this information is very important and um It'll step on some of their their toes, but I hope they're open minded with what I'm about to reveal, and they can um, take time to digest it and ponder it. That that's that's all I ask. And so I wanted to give that heads up before we start. Yeah, uh, you mentioned um, we experienced last year. We had a polar vortex just like this year with the bitter cold temperatures. We had that here in Missouri and all the snow that you mentioned. Uh, we've also had the fact that the uh, ice caps in the north, North Pole region, have grown f- between 43 and 47 percent larger. So definitely um, that's contrary to global warming because the, the ice shelf is thickening and widening. There's some satellite images that NASA has show the ice now versus three years ago, and you can see how much it's it's grown. But the... Um, the long-term forecast is definitely we're in a global cooling trend. I'll explain how extensive it will be, not global warming. And I'll start this conversation by explaining how we got, got on this global warming kick or bandwagon to begin with. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change that uh, the United Nations sponsors, they started to, uh, since the formation of the United Nations, they started to really gather more weather records, temperature data, atmospheric 
uh, land and water temperatures, better records, and, and so forth, really began since the, the UN, that time period, late 40s. And um, what was interesting is between 1910 and 1930, there were pretty accurate records by government agencies back in the late 1800s. But from 1910 to 1930, there was a slight uh, temperature warm-up trend, and then it went sideways for about 20 years, stayed consistent between 1930 and 1950. Then the temperatures started to go down a little bit to, uh, to 1976 or so. And that's, depending on the, how the age of the audience listening, there was a period back then where there was a concern of global cooling. And that was spoken about in universities and, and uh, climatologists, envir environmental scientists such as myself, because of the lateral temperature movements from 1930 to 50, then the temperature started dropping a little bit, and that was a big concern. And then the temperature started to uptick from 1976, and then it peaked uh, around 2000, uh, between 2008 and, and 2010. Well, with the scientific community, when I saw the temperature rise, between 1976 and 2008 and 10, they're trying to figure out, well, was this an anomaly? What's, what's causing the rises in, in temperature? Because scientists out of curiosity always want to have an answer for everything that's going on, or at least find out because they're curious by nature. Well, with funding and research, why these temperatures were rising, they were keeping track of CO2, carbon dioxide levels, and they were also rising. So it was easy to do a simplified linear math equation and equate from 1976 to recent, say 2010. Well, we've got gradual temperature increases and CO2 is increasing. So they found a, a dynamic that a signal of temperature rising in CO2 that coincided and they quickly came to a, a conclusion, well, that's it, that here we, we have a connection. Temperatures are rising because CO2 levels are rising. And wow, if, we, if this trend continues and, and we don't uh, get a handle of the CO2, uh, we're going to have big problems in, in the future. So that created a kind of a, a small panic in the international community and the UN funding studies. Uh, well, is this true? And there's a lot of universities and PhDs that were hungry. This is my opinion, so some people are going to get mad. But they're, they're hungry for uh, grants and research money because just because you're a scientist, you still have a house payment and kids to send to school and credit cards to pay, and it's hard to find a job. So if they could accept funding for climate change studies – they, they signed up because it kept their research labs open, kept money flowing in and making payroll. I guess I can't blame them for that. Everyone needs to work. But the motives, I believe, were a little skewed. And the biggest mistake they made, which I found out dealing with a good friend of mine, Greg Schuler, he's part of a team of brilliant physicists called uh, Dynamic Predictables. They're a, a company – that has long-term climate projections that they give to governments and military organizations. This information is not available to the public. I'm allowed to, on this interview, describe over the airwaves uh, their statistics. Uh, this is going to be a rare interview. It's priceless, but I'm not able to show the graphs or, or charts if that's going to be released, uh, Dynamic Predictables will have to do that on their site. But um, what Greg and the other physicists have told me, the mistake that has been made for the last 40-plus years by government agencies, environmentalists, and, and some universities is they were using linear methods or linear 
mathematical solutions to try to solve a non-equilibrium dynamic or an active system. So those are big fancy words. <laughs> Put it in layman's terms. What that means is our planetary system and our, our solar system is a non-equilibrium uh, dynamic. In other words, it's, it's constantly changing. It's an interactive system. You have uh, planets that wobble and are tilted and, and rotate and travel at different speeds. Uh, our, the speed at which our solar system travels the uh, Milky Way isn't necessarily on cruise control, where it's always going at, at the same speed. Would that, account, have, uh, would, would that account for like the old Babylonian calendar when, when they used to have 360 days and now we have to have 365? Because uh, if, you know, if, uh, if they had actually made a calendar that was that far off, I mean, their seasons would be switching uh, every three or four years uh, by, by, you know, almost a month. So, you know, there's no way that their, their calendar was so inaccurate. So there has to have been some, some serious changes from those ancient times to now is that would that be correct yep and that's that's my, part of my theory and i would agree with you uh, absolutely the, the this uh i'll i'll go back to if if i forget you can remind me i'll go back for the listening audience to describe a little bit what i mean by a linear method versus non-equilibrium method or dynamics and the mistake that the uh, universities and other government institutions have made about global warming. But before I, I get to that, you brought up a point. See, we travel, our, our solar system, our Milky Way is a uh, spiral and it has four major arms. You got the Sagittarius, uh, Perseus, Norma, and Centeros arms. Uh, our solar system is in a smaller spiral arm called the Orion arm. And there's other experts that would be better than I am at explaining this, but this, this will be good enough to get the point. So we're, we're in a smaller arm, not one of the big forearms of our Milky Way galaxy, but our solar system, it takes about 230 million years to make one complete orbit around the center of our Milky Way galaxy. So if you picture, if you're staring at a, uh, clock, the face of, of a clock, picture if our solar system is at the two o'clock position, it encounters different dynamic forces than if our solar system's at the seven o'clock position. Just because of where it's located uh, in its orbit around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So, a lot can happen in a 230 million year period for it to make one complete orbit. So not only to put it in perspective, that's how big 230 million years to make one orbit while it's doing that. It's also oscillating. If you look at a, a sine or cosine wave, it has its peaks and, and troughs. So it takes 70 million years to go from its low point, to its high point, back to its low point, or every 35 million years, our solar system intersects the galactic plane, the center of the galactic plane. So there, there's just so many uh, dynamic forces that planets and stars go through as they're, they're rotating and speeds at which they're traveling through the etheric field uh, that you can't have a, a linear system. It, it just, it, it doesn't fit. Uh, a linear system would mean that th there are constant constants with very little uh, variation. Well, that's not the case uh, at all. So they had simple mathematical equations that are designed for linear fixed environmental conditions. And if you use those linear linear mathematical equations on a nonlinear system, the data is going to be wrong every single time. So what they've done is when they've made these computer models, NOAA and NASA and other agencies, they're using the wrong math. They're using an easier 
series of mathematical equations to come up with models of warming trends that aren't true. So dynamic predictables and these, these physicists with Greg have found how to use a very complicated mathematical systems that take into account a non-equilibrium dynamic, which is what our planet Earth and our solar system operates. It operates in a non-equilibrium dynamics. The math is very, very complicated with uh, sine and cosine uh, calculations using 256-year and 64-year dynamics uh, with zero phase shifts. A lot of mathematicians would understand what that means. But it's very hard math, and they they did their homework. They did long, long, tedious nights and weeks and months and years of these mathematical equations, which aren't easy to do. And if you don't like it, you, you're going to steer away from it. But they're more accurate in their climate predictions because of the extra sophisticated math and series of mathematics they use for a non-equilibrium system. And that's why they're Climate projections are spot on, and it's it's only governments and militaries that they kind of uh, a, a appeal to. So what their trend had found out is we kind of peaked around 2008-ish. You know, you can give or take a couple of years. And we're in a long-term colding trend that the Earth has repeated – and there's the actual uh, data to prove these st statistics. This is a cycle that has been here before and is repeating and will be here long after we're gone. But the temperatures are going to continue to steadily drop and reach its coldest point to about year 2100. And in 2100, year 2100, we're going to be very similar to a pattern uh, that developed in 18, around 1850. And what that means is, b believe it or not, in, in, in 2100, the winters will be much longer and so severe that the Mississippi River will be frozen at New Orleans and they estimate that the Gulf of Mexico will be frozen approximately six miles from the coast during the winter. Wow. Sometimes you can look up, there's old, old pictures in, in, in that time period where Ni Niagara Falls was frozen solid and people were ice skating, you know, those uh, colder temperatures. And it stays that way with a slight uptick from year 2100 to 2130. Uh, very, very slight uptick. Then it falls back down in year 2150 to those cold temperatures where it's frozen six miles, Gulf of Mexico. So that includes Mississippi, Alabama, uh, New Orleans. And then it slowly gets warmer from year 2160 until 2265 year 2265 temperatures will be like they were two years ago. So that's the long-term climate projection. What that means, how is that relevant to us? Well, it's, it should be relevant to us, but also the next generation, our kids and grandchildren, because they're going to be alive when this gets its coldest in year 2100. That... Um, the growing season will be shorter and shorter, so the winters will last longer. And your production in Canada and northern United States, Poland, at that point will probably will be non-existent. the the uh, The winters will be too long. The problem with that is, as everyone knows, most of the population live in the northern hemisphere, and what really feeds the world the 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 main breadbaskets are Canada, United States, Poland, Ukraine, and Brazil. Well, Brazil's in the Southern Hemisphere, so let's concentrate on Northern Hemisphere. This long-term colding trend is going to affect food production globally. So if, 
if I were a government uh, uh, official, and what governments technically, with you know finger quotes in the air, are supposed to protect and guides their citizenry and, and civilization. My personal th- thoughts are instead of the, the trillions of dollars in military expenditures and, and, and so forth, which, which I don't uh, agree with, governments should really be planning for this long-term accurate global cooling trend and figure out how they're going to feed their citizenry, citizenry in the world when the growing season gets shorter and most of the countries of Canada, United States, Poland won't be able to grow corn, wheat, uh, rapeseed and, and other commodities. Can you give us a, a can you give us like a, a little uh, snapshot of what we're going to be looking at five years out, ten years out, and twenty years out? So we'll say uh, in twenty twenty, what are we looking at? And twenty uh, twenty twenty five and uh, twenty thirty five. Okay, we're um, basically you can f- we we peaked in two thousand eight. So from, from 2006, 7, 8, the temperatures start to drop. To answer your question, we'll go back in time. So in 2020, we will have temperatures in 2020. Let me look at this. Like we had in 1976. And in 2030, we'll have temperatures like we had in 1945. And then uh, it really starts getting noticeably cold in longer winters in 2080. And it's a fast drop from year 2080 to 2100, those those, uh, 20 years. So uh, the next five or 10 years, it's not cataclysmic. So they'll still be growing food in Canada and the United States. But... The serious concern of temperature dropping is 2075, because from year 2075 to year 2100, it's a very fast temperature drop. It's it's way too late for any governments or even individuals to prepare after 2075. If they don't have greenhouses in effect, in effect and growing techniques for greenhouses and an energy supply before 2070, they're not going to make it. So the, this, this, the listeners, you don't panic. Nothing's going to collapse in the next 10 or 15 years, and we're not going to not have food at grocery stores. That If that happens, it's a different reason. But with climate, you have to think geologically. You have to think hundreds and thousands of years, not, not short terms. So this information really – for to digest is living it's the mindset of of living and and building concepts home construction and farming techniques start thinking about it now for our children and grandchildren they are going to be lassoed uh, with this so current two by four two by six construction with your fiberglass or blow-in insulation even isoline the foam insulation spring those building techniques aren't that's not what you want to do in Canada, Northern Europe, Northern United States. So you want to build more energy efficient homes like insulated concrete forms that have a, a R50 rating and they, they maintain even if temperatures are zero or 10 degrees, they like a cave, they'll maintain a 50 degree temperature year round. You want to adopt those building techniques and then you want indoor greenhouse growing techniques well established before year two. 2070. It's time for a quick break, and we'll be right back. The dollar's lost over 90% of its purchasing power since 1971. Silver, on the other hand, has proved to be a very stable form of wealth preservation over the years. And where do you buy silver? Silver.com, of course. Silver.com offers fantastic prices on silver and gold. Check out silver.com today. So you don't expect this to even be something that would affect the uh uh, food production even over the next 20 years well it, it will but not not to where the average citizenry can notice it i think farmers up north in canada now they'll notice a shorter growing season yes in the next 
15 or 18 years, but it's not going to bankrupt them and they'll have crop failure. But they'll start to, uh, by year 2070, they're going to have a hard time unless they have developed greenhouses and year-round growing with with an energy source, whether it's solar or something of, of that nature. So there's there's time to prepare, but humans have a tendency to procrastinate until the last minute. And and this, I guess, the warning that I'd be giving and, and Greg and with their company is to to start adopting, start using your heads communities, governments, even individuals start and starting with the youth, we need to start teaching in these northern climates, better building techniques for warmer housing that are more energy efficient and then also growing techniques. Don't wait. My, my words of caution, because I don't think I'll be here in 2070, who knows, but um, to have this well in place before 2070. Well, really, now's a good time to start with educating the youth and then governments run as slow as molasses, but for them to start adopting budgets and research on growing techniques that are year round, but they're uh, resistant to outside uh, temperatures, which is uh, greenhouses. There's, there's modules. Now you've probably seen them on the internet where they take these shipping containers. Uh, Typically the, they come overseas on the uh, shipping vessels and then they can load them on semi trucks or railroad cars, but they're the 40 foot long or 80 foot long steel uh, structures. There's a lot of companies now that convert those into greenhouses with LED, uh, very energy efficient grow lamps with the different wavelengths, uh, white, yellows, and blue wavelengths for growing. And you could stack them 10 high, 20 high. So you could literally have stackable indoor growing farms in the bitter cold in Canada and the people can still eat, even though temperatures are things like that need to start to be considered and technology steered that way, research and development so that uh, we're not caught off guard. But I I, I think I'm rare. Most people don't think that far in the future or plan. They kind of wait to the last minute, but there'll be enough listening out there that hopefully this will, they'll respond to this information and I'm not wasting my time. Yeah. And if you've got kids, if, if you, if you're, if your wife just had a baby yesterday, uh, that child would be 55 years old in, in 2070, uh, you know, probably getting near to the point of, of starting to think about retirement and, uh, and probably not in a great position to be uh, thinking about completely radically changing uh, their lifestyle. So, you know, uh, the earlier you get this information, the better. If you've got a 10-year-old, uh, that 10 year old is going to be 65 in 2070 and That's right. uh, and and a 20 year old is going to be 75 so uh the 75 year old is is going to be uh even in a, in a a less favorable position to be making drastic changes to to their lifestyle so it's certainly something uh a, a great thing for them to start keeping their eye on right now and you know like we saw last year with the polar vortex you know uh, these are sort of the trend lines, and then anytime you have a, a downward trend line, you can always get sort of these black swan years that uh, you know are X amount of uh, standard deviations away from the mean to where you could have a couple of years or a year or two in a row even uh, throughout that overall trend line where we do have some crop failure. So uh, certainly something that everybody can keep an eye on. Now, uh, one of the things that Revelations mentions in Revelation 6.6 6 is a quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages. That sounds like hyperinflation for food. And that's something that, that certainly sounds like it could be triggered by uh, extreme weather, uh, whether it's droughts or this, uh, this cooling trend or uh, you know some black swan years in there uh, on, on a downward uh, cooling trend like that. What do you think? Yes, that'll happen because uh, the, these hiccups that you mentioned, despite this long-term colding trend, and there's no way we're going to change it, uh, so we'll have to deal with it. You're right. There's there's going to be uh, typical cases where you could have a, uh, a polar vortex that, that hits in mid-March or late March, and it freezes crops that was unexpected maybe reached down to Florida and it was a four or five day 
cold snap, well, that was enough to kill the citrus crops. Or just something simple as uh, Yellowstone, the super volcano that, that's been active. I'm sure most of the audience, your, your listening audience, is, is awake and attuned to this. If, Val, if Yellowstone popped, the, the devastation that that would have with, with the ash suspended in the air, it's like a nuclear winter. That would affect the entire northern hemisphere, uh, drop uh, temperatures by permitting the sun's rays from penetrating. And then the ash falls probably uh, – I've had some geology as environmental science. You have to, but I'm not a 100 uh, percent geologist. But it's – I think that ring, if you, you take a ring of probably 400 miles radius of Yellowstone, all that ash that falls in there turns the soil acidic. Well, you can forget any kind of growing in Canada and Kansas and Iowa. So even that event would affect uh, food prices and the, the avail- availability of the soil to produce. Because it takes a long time for soil to recover from acidic conditions such as a volcano uh, aftermath of volcanic ash. So all those things, it's just prudent to be aware and like you mentioned in Bible prophecy, that's not a that's not a joke. They they, they did didn't make these things up through uh, their visions and inspiration. That's it's just smart to think about how to feed yourself and and be prepared for long term trends or these like you mentioned these hiccups that are definitely there. And th- see, there's ways to prepare. If if a government's asleep at the switch, that doesn't mean you have to be. So you made a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. If you, if you have a, uh, a newborn the last few weeks or a few months or a 10-year-old, they're going to be around to see this. So you care about them. And if you have any grandchildren, same thing. Well, now's the time to – I don't think I'm too early on my Paul Revere campaign kind of warning of what's coming. It's, it's good to start teaching the youth uh, farming techniques and uh, build your own greenhouse and uh, learn how to grow – year round. And fortunately, we've got uh, better technology with solar panels and uh, lighting with these LEDs that are energy efficient and they're not hot, as hot as they used to be. So it's very feasible to maybe grow food year round in these northern climates. Start, my opinion, be start practicing, start developing that now that it'd be a great business to get into year round growing. It's organic food, very healthy. You're getting away from the GMOs. And uh, you start now, now you've also trained the next one or two generations behind you. I, th- I think it's a smart way to go. And uh, I'm 44. So in 55 years, if I'm still around, uh, in 2070, I would be 99, which it might be very unlikely. But my grandmother's 101. So, so it's not impossible by any stretch, you know, uh, she's already made it two years past that and really shows no sign of, uh, of quitting. So, uh, uh, it's certainly, it's certainly feasible. And, uh, you know, and if I am around at 99, the last thing I'm going to be wanting to do though, is worry about this stuff. So, uh, you know, it's certainly things that I'm going to, I'm going to keep in mind, uh, throughout my, my long-term planning and and preparing because you have to be you have to make sure that you're you're uh, financially and in, in the best shape and uh, and uh, maybe uh, geospatially you know in the in the best shape possible making sure that you're in the a survivable climate for for if these types of things happen you know for long term and you have to do that planning now you know my grandmother did she she did fairly good planning and so she's got the money to to make sure that she's in a a good position and in, in, in the you know she has a sort of a semi assisted living uh facility where she's at and you know i'm sure that she probably had never planned intended on living that long but it's a good thing that she that she had the 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 financial wherewithal to do it uh, once that once she did end up living that long, so you, you kind of have to prepare for 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 the the longest possible uh, scenario, and then uh, you know if you if you get called home early, you know glory hallelujah. <laughs> right, because and if I to, to kind of tie in the, the interview we had last, as your audience might remember, I'm uh, the co-inventor of that photo 
catalytic oxidation that NASA developed originally, and I was on the scientific team later that improved it. But par- part of the, the, the motivation for the research, which I oh, – this is just a side note. You know, there's over 1,500 cases of Ebola virus, and there was only 40 when we spoke last. So it, it is spreading in the United States, even though the media was forced to kind of not cover it. But besides the uh, – or, or PCO technology to kill viruses and pathogens uh, in, in the air and surfaces to, from preventing pandemics. It was also developed for indoor plant growing. Because if, if you recall, I mentioned in the space program, they had these hydroponic plants. Because if there's any type of long-term split space exploration, you need to be able to grow your food. Well, the reason why I'm tying this in is, as we're forced to have more indoor growing greenhouses or these growing pods that are popping up, uh, our technology, the reason why we worked so hard on this is we knew that indoor growing would be necessary for human society in these colder regions. This kills plant pathogens and creates a very healthy environment for plants, but there's nothing toxic. There's no pesticides, herbicides, or irradiation. So you can have year-round growing with the photocatalytic oxidation, the bipolar ion clusters, and have zero crop failure. It's being installed right now. There's uh, greenhouses around the world that have installed. This is not a sales pitch. I'm just telling you it's being used right now in greenhouses that supply for Whole Foods and other organic grocery stores, having problems with the uh, stachybotry, the S. charterum molds, yellow, black, green molds. Uh, this eliminates all those plant pathogens. They're having 100% crop uh, success, and it's already being implemented. But I knew with these long-term forecasts, part of my goal in life, not that I can save the world single-handedly, but that's my goal as a research scientist is everything that I invent, including a grain remediation that I'm working on, how to take contaminated grain and salvage it so it's edible for humans and animals. Because over a, a fifth of the world's grain is lost in storage due to uh, microbial contamination. But all of this research I, I'm doing to, to help because mankind is the tsunami is coming where there'll not be enough food in every cup every scoop of grain is going to be precious like you said it's worth its weight in gold or a day's wage for a cup of grain those days are coming and uh the the technology that i have was steered to help maximize crop yield and prevent crop failure to try to uh survive what's coming give us a standing chance so i'm just not sitting idle i'm fighting using all of my skill and and knowledge to invent safe technologies to help with food production and keep people healthy. And then on top of the really bad freeze last year, we had that horrible drought, uh, in the, in the West. And, uh, that, that had a lot of, uh, effects on, on crops. Yeah, it's really bad in, uh, California because they, um, it's getting close to where almost it's it's not going to be repairable, and so much produce comes out of California. People don't realize, and this is years. Uh, their 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 water tables are uh, about gone, and then you get on the other side of the Rockies. Las Vegas is is sinking, and their aquifers is is, is about gone. So water issues, as you mentioned, is another. People be wars will be being fought over fresh water access. That's the, that's a big problem right now in Pakistan and India fighting over the Indus River uh, where they've got armies facing each other. Uh, and that's that's a very geopolitical hotspot that doesn't get much news media, but that's fighting over the water and Pakistan really needs it. And the, the UN Treaty gave the rights to Pakistan but allows India to use it for irrigation and hydro hydropower and there's some tensions over that. So, yeah, that's there's a lot that's on the plate right now with mankind. It can go sideways very quickly. It's, um, it's scary times. It's unpredictable that's going to happen, but it's also, I believe, a, a time to have 
uh, faith, not to get preachy with the audience, but um, these are interesting times that we live in for sure. Yeah. I, and, and so oh, it, yeah. Makes, it makes sense to, to have some basic food storage uh, even right now. Of course, I, that, that's basic insurance. It, just because, let's say there isn't any Armageddon scenario or uh, uh, solar flare like the Carrington event back in the 1800s where it fried all the cable, tele, cable communication network. It's just you never know when there's going to be uh, a grid that goes down or a, a, a tornado, hurricane, uh, of something of that nature. There could be a trucker strike. Uh, that that happens, and so what well, I think the average grocery store within three days the shelves could be empty. So it just makes common sense to have six months storable food, uh, water filters, uh, gravity fed water filters, and sanit sanitization tablets. That to me, see if you're a, I might be getting on my soapbox, but if you're a true man or head of a household, your obligation really is is the protection of your family and as far as its morality and spirituality and also uh, provisions. So maybe instead of watching football and uh, baseball or th things of that nature, you, you should prepare uh, for the what ifs for your family and, and having uh, certain provisions like that and a backup generator. And so it's just common sense. So maybe, Hold off on the new pickup truck, drive it for a couple more years, but make sure he has some storable food and a solar generator and water filters. And, and that's that's being a true father, a true husband, because you're you're thinking of your family and uh, you're being wise. And maybe a little backyard garden, too, because that's that's something I, I see a lot of preppers and they'll buy these survival uh, seed uh, vaults, which are probably good because that it's it is keeping that seed uh, you know, those seeds will, will last uh, for a long, long time the way that they're sealed in there. But um, if you haven't, if you've never grown a garden, that that learning curve is going to take you out because it's not something that you do. You go out and you, you dig a hole in the backyard and uh, six months later you got a crop of corn. There's a huge learning curve with, uh, with having a garden and I've had to go through that over the past, uh, I'd say, five years. And every year I'm learning more and more. Uh, every time I, I, I have a new garden, I, I learn something else, and I'm sure I'll continue to learn uh, going forward with that. And uh, and even after doing it for five years, if I were to have to produce 100% of my own food, I'd be I'd be really in a crunch. And uh, you know, but you know, if I just needed to supplement because uh, you know fresh vegetables were too high, you know, maybe you could still get rice and beans and things like that but fresh vegetables just became inaccessible you know i could certainly supplement my diet and, and make sure that i had some some fresh green things uh to provide for my family well mark that's an excellent point i'm, I'm glad you brought that up because you're absolutely right it takes over two years to get an established garden and you better start practicing now because it's a tough skill to have that green thumb there's an art to it you, you better start learning now than when you really uh, need to. And the uh, w one th thing to throw out there for the, some of the advanced science research, I don't know if you've heard this before, this might sound way out there, but at least I'll, no pun intended, I'll plant the seeds for your audience to think about. When you plant the world we live in today with grocery stores and, and drive through uh, fast food restaurants, that's not reality. How, how we were designed on this planet is more like the indigenous tribes worldwide. Two things to remember. H how seeds work, we're, we're all supposed to work the land our, ourselves. And how it's supposed to work is you're supposed to take a seed and put it underneath your tongue and your saliva containing your DNA will coat the pericarp, the outer coating of the seed, you take, the say it's a carrot seed or a broccoli or lettuce, each seed you're supposed to put in your mouth, get your coated DNA saliva on it, plant it one by one, do a carrot seed, do broccoli one by, and what happens is that particular garden, that is Mark's garden, and the seed with your DNA information will know what nutrients and how to grow that carrot so that when you eat that carrot, that carrot has grown and is custom to your body's blood chemistry 
and your bone marrow and your nutrients. Now, if your wife is doing it and say you have a son or daughter, their carrot is going to be different than your carrot and your wife's carrot. People don't even realize how this works at a biological level. That's not taught in universities or schools. So we're meant to grow our own food that's been custom tailored to our DNA by one by one or saliva on the seed. So that takes time. You can imagine how much time that takes. Then it's customized. And when you're in the garden, you should be barefoot because it's important for, for because we're a biochemical, we, we have a, electrical signals and so do plants. When you're barefoot, you're grounded. When you wear shoes, boots or tennis shoes with rubber soles, it, you're, you're not grounded. So working with the soil, barefoot and in your hands, there's a symbiotic relationship between you and the plant. And I know this might sound corny, but, but you, you become one. And, and that's how we're meant to be. But, but we're, we've been disconnected by this false reality. I know I'm getting on my soapbox, but driving to the grocery store and you're buying a carrot, you don't know what farmer planted the carrot. It could be five states away or from Chile. Who, who knows? It doesn't have your DNA signature on it, so the nutritional value is not there. That, that's a false reality. So the sooner we can learn how nature works and how we were designed and teach our children how to work in the garden – and it doesn't matter what the temperature is. You get used to not having shoes, and you're talking to the plants. The plants respond to your voice. They like laughter. Uh, they can hear you. There, there's even studies that show that while you're talking, plants will move towards you, almost like they're listening. But there's energy signatures that the plants are picking up. Well, th then when you eat the plant, everything is re recycled. Uh, even when we die, we decompose and turn back into soil. This is... That's how we're really supposed to, to live and be connected with, with the earth, and we're, we're not taught that. So we, we are very alienated from nature and how we're designed. So we really, there's no pun intended, we need to get back to the roots of learning to work the earth and, and be one with the soil and the communication with the plants and animals. I know people think, well, you're a tree hugger, but I'm a research scientist, and I'm telling you this is true. The work I've done in labs, what I'm discovering every week is just blowing my mind. And I'm glad you have shows like this, Mark, because I'm just so grateful of your shows and your listening ear and your, your audience. Because sooner or later, someone will hear this and they'll think about it. They'll think, well, Weston's kind of, that's a weird concept. I never heard of that. But I tell you, they're going to remember what I mentioned about the seed and coding DNA. Next time they're in the grocery store grabbing carrots, broccoli, or celery, they're going to think of what I said. And if I'm telling the truth, which I am, it will resonate. Your gut core will realize that I'm not lying and, and I'm telling the truth, and, and it'll, it'll stick. And I think what I'm saying is crucial, and, and I think long-term it's life-saving for us as a species. Sounds very different than the, the Monsanto model of uh, having this genetically modified stuff that will basically grow on concrete <laughs> with no water. Uh, so I, I think that what we're going to have to do is probably get you back on in the spring when it's uh, near planting time and, okay. and, and talk about uh, gardening and, and, and some, some different uh, techniques that – I, certainly I've never heard of before, and I, I'm sure that a lot of people out there would be very interested to hear more about that. Would that be, would that be good? Oh, that, that'd be perfect. Like you said, spring uh, for the growing season, and I can talk more about how uh, our relationship works with plants and soil composition because this is real science not taught in schools and universities, and the, the ruling elite, uh, this information is on lockdown. They do not want us to know how it really works and how it can benefit. So anytime you can have me on and we can have this discussion, uh, it's great. I'm all for it. And, and I, I love our, our interviews anyway, Mark. I think you're, you're just a great person. Thank you very much. Now, Weston, tell the folks where they can find you and where they can go to uh, learn more about uh, your indoor purification technology and, and, and all of that. Yeah, right. For uh, the plants and growing, it's global envirotech, t e c h dot com, global envirotech dot com, and uh, I don't do the, the Facebook and, and Twitter and so forth. I, I don't. I think there are sinister motives in that, but I, I am on LinkedIn. Uh, that's kind of a social media, but it's business oriented for professionals. People can find me on LinkedIn or. Uh, globalenvirotech.com. There's an email 
contact and my phone number. In fact, Mark, some of your my last presentation, I've had a lot of calls from all over the world about the PCO technology. I even had one of your avid listeners flew in from the East Coast and just spent two days with me uh, regarding this technology. And, and your show has a great uh, impact. And a lot of your listeners have called and got me personally, and they're like, is this Weston? I, I, absolutely. You can actually call me, and hopefully you, I won't get any prank phone calls or death threats. But <laughs> All right. everyone's been nice and kind. All right. Well, Happy New Year, and thanks again for taking time to come on the show at this really busy time of year. No problem, Mark, and we'll talk in the spring. Are we living in a time of which there is more prophetic writings than of any period in history? Watch through the eyes of Noah Parker and his family as a global empire takes shape. Ancient writings are fulfilled, and the last days fall upon the once great United States of America. The Days of Noah, Book One, Conspiracy by Mark Goodwin, is a fast-paced fiction thriller which looks at how modern conspiracies could play into biblical prophecy concerning end times. Buy The Days of Noah in paperback, Kindle, or audio edition at Amazon.com today.